and good morning to some of you in other parts of the world. I don't know if you are still alive and awake. Don't worry, this will be your last lecture for the for the day. And uh, I really would like to, first of all, congratulate all our excellent speakers who just uh, finished uh, sharing to us their lectures and their experiences and may also uh, underscore the role, the big role of uh, Momark and its collaborative work with Smart MD, and of course, uh, the rest of the staff uh, working behind to make this a very uh, successful meeting for all of us. And at the same time, I would like to also thank uh, those who have helped us, uh, the uh, WISCO, and of course, uh, those who have uh, attended this meeting from different parts of the world. So uh, this is a concluding lecture and uh, a lot of those lectures were already shared to us. And uh, what I'm gonna do right now is simply to uh, give a summary of all those lectures that were shared to us initially during this meeting. So the topic that I'm going to share with you is about uh, the pearls and pitfalls in ultrasound guided injections. <clears throat> of course, uh, when we start our practice, and do these procedures. There are always times that uh, we encounter difficulty in the process of injecting. And not only with the skills that we have developed, but also with the solutions that uh, we are doing and the machines that we are using. So I kind of summarize this talk by identifying three sources of pitfalls that could also be a source of your pearls and your skill. And uh, the first one is the injector, meaning the doctor himself, uh, the modalities you're using, what kind of machine you're using. And then of course, the type of solutions you're using, is it the appropriate solution for a particular problem or a disease? The use of needles, the choice of needles, how it's related to the target site, and all of these issues would help us understand why sometimes there is failure in our procedures. Now, we are all learning here, and every time this lecture uh, takes place in a conference like this, uh, there are always new information. And so we have uh, a series of learning experience that we would like to learn it from, and these experiences will help us in the future to be able to make things better. And we are still in the evolving stage up to this moment. So there are things that maybe some of you have already learned and some of you are still learning and some of you are in, a, in the advanced stage. So you will all have to learn this together. And of course, the site of uh, the injection is also important. The tendons, the joints, the nerves, the ligaments, and the rest of the other musculoskeletal structures. So for instance here, uh, if you talk about the modalities between ultrasound maybe versus uh, fluoroscopy, of course, sometimes uh, some people would like to use MRI or CT scan guided procedures. There are always trends and weaknesses. We, we wouldn't say that ultrasound has all the solutions for all the procedures that we're doing. Fluoroscopy is, a, is also important. So there should be a balance of which modalities we're going to use. For instance, in a research uh, done by Dr. Finoff and colleagues in 2008, they highlight the importance of ultrasound if the target tissues involve the piriformis, for instance. So this is a soft tissue, so it's better seen and uh, visualized under ultrasound guidance. And 95% of the target in this case will be identified by ultrasound versus 
if you're using fluoroscopic guidance, you can only identify maybe 30% based on this study. But a recent study published by Stelzer and Collins highlight also the importance of fluoroscopy, especially for SI joints. And so while it is true that ultrasound is important, it is also important to realize that there are limitations for these modalities. And so in, this, in the case of fluoroscopy versus ultrasound for SI joint, fluoroscopy in this case has an advantage. So you can see here that different sites, different tissues in the interfaces involved is also important in deciding which modalities you're going to use in the, in the process of injecting. But since we are into, uh, a lot of us are doing ultrasound, that I just would like to remind you that the, the, the accuracy of the sites, although it depends upon the level of your, of your skill, is only 5%. But if you're in the advanced stage, you can actually see that and you can actually uh, use that uh, modalities for, for that particular joint. But what, what I'm saying here is that for those who are still beginning, uh, and then you would like to see and image those structures, fluoroscopy has an advantage. Now, I would like to show you here the different areas by which uh, you can use these modalities and which one is better for what particular area. For example, uh, I, we included here is in this study, palpation, which this was published by Dr. Gerard Malanga. You, you know them already. And Dr. Mautner used to be one of us uh, giving lectures here. And so as you, as you can see in the ultrasound, you have 100% accuracy if you inject with an AC, the AC joint, versus if you're doing palpation, which is only 40%. Uh, the other thing that we are injecting is, of course, the glenium rel joint. And the gluneumeral joint has an accuracy of about 95% versus palpation, which is 79%, and fluoroscopy guidance, which is 72%. So you can see it's kind of close. So again, the skill level uh, really plays a role here. And how about the SSSD bursa? So here you will notice that uh, it is 100% for ultrasound compared to palpation and fluoroscopy, which is within 60%. And the rest, bicep shift is 100% if you're using ultrasound versus palpation, which is just 66%. Of course, uh, for those of you who are familiar with the knee, uh, a lot of uh, other uh, practitioners can actually access the knee joint in the cavity. And so it has a very high uh, percentage of accuracy at 79%. But then if you're using an ultrasound guidance, it is 99%. Now, for the lower extremity, for instance, here, the tibio-talar joint, the ultrasound plays a very uh, important role. You will notice that it's 100% versus 85% for palpation. And so you can see here the advantage of using uh, the ultrasound as the modality in order to image specific structures and the amount of confidence that you are, that you are experiencing and you know well that you have actually delivered the medicine where it is needed. Okay, now deciding which modality to use in terms of solution is also important for you for your interventional procedures. Now we have heard from different lecturers uh, what kind of modality is important and at the same time, what particular areas would be best seen by using that modality. So it's, it's always important that we, 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 we use them. Of course, there are instruments right now which combines both ultrasound and fluoroscopy in one machine. And so in the background, that's what you, what you see there. And if you have the, the luxury of having that machine, that would be for your advantage, but uh, to some that would be very expensive. Now, how about solutions? Uh, we also, heard about the different solutions that, that is uh, present. And uh, as mentioned earlier, we mentioned about the 5% dextrose water. Some are using platelet-rich plasma. Maybe for those of you who are in the advanced stage of using regenerative uh, products, you have heard about exosomes. And then of course here you have alpha-2 macroglobulin, and then you have mesenchymal stem cells. Now, choosing from this, 
which one would, would, would you think would be best for you? So it is very important because this will actually make or break your results. So if, if you don't choose the best modality, then maybe, and of course, choosing the best solution, maybe it would matter in terms of the success that you are experiencing. And what I'm saying with this, uh, choices is that uh, we are, we're not trying to focus more on one solution, but the available solutions that we can use and that would give us the best uh, treatment re uh, results for a patient is really important. So let's try to see what are the differences. So here, I tried to summarize all the different uh, solutions here, as you can see, it, the effect, the mechanism of action, the frequency of treatment. I saw in the, in the in the chat group that there are uh, persons who are asking how many sessions is required for, for a particular solution. So this is very important. And the effectivity, the outcome, we would not want to tell our patients that with this procedure, you will attain 100%. That's what we were saying. Because in reality, we cannot achieve that actually. And is there any side effect? So here, for those of you who are, who are using different modalities, let me just go run through these different solutions. For example, let's start with a 5% dextrose. Now, what is the mechanism? It's actually a trip B1 and trip A1 inhibitor. So it's a transient receptor, vanilloid one receptor. And this is the one in charge for controlling the sodium and calcium uh, movement in the cellular um, uh, level. And so when you allow them to move, then of course there is pain. But when you inhibit it, it slows down the sodium and potassium currents and that will effect into a relief of pain. But the question is, will it give you a total relief right away? Of course not. So sometimes you have to tell your patient, and you have to be very honest with your patients. So how many sessions will this really take? So for instance, in 5% in dextrose, you can, you can get relief for about four sessions, or sometimes you need an ad additional two more sessions to be able to get the full relief of a particular problem. Because there's also a pattern of recovery. For instance, if you go back to the lecture of Dr. Lisa early this morning, he mentioned about, she mentioned about um, treating the more proximal part first, and then as you treat the more proximal part, then the distal part, sometimes during the recovery phase, begins to be symptomatic. And so you have to follow that until eventually you go to the most distal and the pain is gone. So you don't just do it once, you need more uh, sessions. And usually on the average, we do four to six sessions. Now the duration is also important because the patient would ask you uh, up to when will this be uh, happening? How, how many months would it take for a particular solution to give me a relief? So. The effectivity, of course, is 88.6% with 11.4% poor results, but the duration and the average is about three to six months. You have to also mention that you're patient because they might expect it won't come back anymore, which really doesn't happen. It sometimes recurs, and so you have to tell them up, up to when will this take effect. And that is very important for patients to, to make an intelligent decision as to what kind of treatment you would like to do. Okay, so we're done with the 5% dextrose. Uh, now let's move on to the platelet-rich plasma. So a lot of us are doing platelet-rich plasma, but let me just mention this early on that not all PRP are created equal. Why did I say that? Because some people just use 10 cc of blood, some use 20 cc of blood, some use 60 cc of blood. So would that be the same? The, the usual acceptable average of group factors and platelets should be at least five times the normal level. So if your range of platelet is 150 to 300, you should have at least five times that volume to be able to call it platelet-rich plasma. Otherwise, you don't call it really PRP or platelet rich, you call it platelet poor plasma. And so we have to make a distinction between what is platelet rich and what is platelet poor 
so that patients understand that we are injecting platelet rich and not platelet poor. If you don't do that, then we might just make the patient believe we are injecting PRP when we actually we are injecting just platelet poor plasma. So anyway, so what is the mechanism? So it releases uh, growth factors that induces regenerative actions. And in fact, it has also an anti-cytokine effect. You see, we have pro-inflammatory cytokines. We have TNF-alpha, interleukin-1, interleukin-6. These are considered to be your pro-inflammatory cytokines. So platelet rich has an effect on that. But the thing is, it also has a near nerve growth factor. The nerve growth factor that is contained in a platelet rich plasma has a very painful side effect. So sometimes you have to mention that to your patient because it's not relief that the patient will feel right away. But in fact, in the first two days to three days, the patient will feel pain. And the patient wonders, I came here to your clinic and I complain of pain and you are adding more pain to me. You have to tell him that because otherwise you might end up just aggravating the pain, which is not supposed to be present. And at the same time, it has also the ability to modulate M1, which is pro-inflammatory macrophage, to M2, which is an anti-inflammatory macrophage. So when you inject platelet-rich plasma, then you tend to actually modulate the responses of the macrophage from a pro-inflammatory macrophage, which is M1, to an anti-inflammatory macrophage, which is M2. So how many sessions would, requ would be required? Well, not just once. Maybe you might need one to three sessions, depending on the age of the patient, depending on the injury of the patients, the severity of the pain. So you need to consider all that. And usually you inject it every two weeks. So those are things that you have to remember when you are going to do this uh, PRP procedure. Now, how about the duration? Patients would, uh, would ask you, until when will this take effect? So the duration would be longer than the dextrose, which is three to six months. This would uh, last up to about six months to about a year, okay? So there are different uh, studies saying that the duration could only last up to one year. And we have to also be honest to our patient because those are important information that the patient has to know before we do the procedures. Of course, after we've done with PRP, then we will move to exosomes. What is an exosome? These are very small extracellular uh, proteins that clings to the cell membrane of the cells. And this actually acts by reducing the production of inflammatory cytokines, decreasing the mat matrix metalloproteasers or MMPs, and increase interleukin-10, which is an anti-inflammatory cytokine. And this could be coming uh, derived from blood, in which case from the PRP, or this could be derived from the mesenchymal stem cells, from the adipose, or from the bone marrow exosome. So, and of course, there are other sources like the umbilical cord. So these are different uh, sources where we can get exosomes. Now, how many sessions would be required? It depends upon the case of the patient, but on the average, we can do about one to two sessions. And since it's still, still in the early stage of development, the results are very inconsistent. Sometimes it, uh, it, it gives relief, sometimes it doesn't. So it's very hard to make a very categorical ans answer to a question of uh, the duration of effectivity. And of course, there are also few side effects depending on where you derive your exosomes from the umbilical cord or from the mesenchymal stem cells. And of course, my favorite among this solution is of course A2M, alpha-2 macroglobulin. And uh, this uh, solution has amazed me because actually this is derived from the platelet poor portion of the PRP. Remember, I, I explained to you, you have to get the PRP, which is at the mid portion, which is at the middle when you process it, that's the middle portion of the, of the, of the tube. And then sometimes you get rid of the PPP, but unfortunately or unfortunately, the A2M is derived from the platelet poor uh, portion of the plasma. There are two ways you can process that. You can use uh, the cytonics technology or you can use the filtration technology. So depending on what you would like to uh, purchase or acquire. But uh, 
in a general as a general effect the mechanism action is it, it inhibits the pro-inflammatory cytokines which are your tnf alpha interleukin 1 beta and interleukin 6 the good thing about um, a2m is that it has doesn't have an ngf and that is why the pain is very immediate and at the same time it re it's reserved for the more severe chronic type of osteoarthritis because it has its own matrix uh, matrix metalloproteases so it inhibits those proteins which are actually the cause of pain in the joints in the nerves and in some other areas of neuropathic pain so for neuropathic pain this is uh the choice that i do for these procedures and usually it will require about one to two sessions in two weeks as well and we, we we're doing a preclinical studies and uh, it will be coming out this year we have two paper being prepared and and so the result shows that it lasted up about one to two years so um watch out for the results of the publication as uh, we release it this year and then, of course, uh, moving on, we have the mesenchymal stem cells. And the mesenchymal stem cells could be derived from the bone marrow or the adipose tissue. These are multipotent stem cells and has anabolic growth factor effects. It has an anti-inflammatory cytokine effect. It modulates inflammatory response. It has an anti-apoptotic effect. So with, compared to the rest of the other solutions, I would say this is a very good potential for regenerative capacity. Although you can also mix that together with PRP. Some people mix adipose being the scaffold, bone marrow being the main ingredient, and platelet-rich plasma being the contributor of the growth factors. And it has a very good effect if you combine them all, uh, together. So usually we just do one session and... Uh, Usually it has an 80% to 30% decrease in pain scores over one year. Other studies extended up to about two years pain relief. But caution here is uh, it should not be done for patients with history of cancer because there's a possibility of neoplastic transformation. And of course, the last is the most common. I included this because uh, this is also one of the more uh, commonly used and I heard it from different lectures here. The use of steroids. So what is the, the mechanism action? It inhibits cytokine, chemokine, addition molecule production. It inhibits COX-2 induction. And usually you can only do that one to two treatments per year because of the side effect. It can increase your blood pressure. It can uh, increase your blood sugar. It can make the tendon or ligament uh, easily ruptured. So uh, not advisable if you keep repeating that. And uh, the duration of effectivity could last up to two weeks up to and then up to three months. Sometimes if it is very early and, and it's, it's just uh, a simple case of um, bursitis or calcific tendinosis, then you can have a prolonged long-term effect when you actually evacuate that uh, calcium deposit at the same time uh, use steroids for your treatment. Okay, so now let's move on to the needling technique. Now, the injection can, uh, is as effective as the way you actually administer it. So I just make it very simple. It's just uh, three choices. It's either an in-plane approach, an out-plane approach, approach, and of course, for ir irregular uh, joints, you can use the um, standoff technique. So here, we're using in-plane approach. And the idea here is that to make the needle as perpendicular, as parallel with the probe as possible. So you put the, pro the needle at the center of the probe, make it parallel. And then what you can see is a very... Um, visible conspicuous image of the needle from the needle tip up to the shaft with the rever reverberation artifact that you can see uh, as, as a shadow. So if you, if you see this, that means you're, you're just on the right track and your angle 
is not as uh, as acute as what you would you like to uh, make it to be. So, in plain approach is the, the the easiest way to approach a deal. So, when you do in plain approach, it should be you, you should position yourself ergonomically that the you you would be sitting in here. You would see the target, and then right in front of you is the is the ultrasound. So so that you have only one visual field and direction of your injection. In that case, it would be very easy for you to inject without actually causing so much pain and probably uh, dizziness when you, <laughs> when you cannot find where your needle is located, okay? So uh, you can do a direct intratendinous injection here. Uh, this is uh, injecting in the uh, uh, supraspinatus tendons in the, in the shoulder. And uh, when you try to inject that area, then, then you can actually see that sometimes there is uh, that invisible tear that you don't, you don't see initially, but when you actually infuse the fluid, you can see a tear that's opening up when you, when you do the injection, which is very useful if you do that kind of injection. Or you can also inject it at the joint, in this case, at the posterior glenohumeral joint, and it gets right to the space where the joint is, and you can infuse the fluid right into the joint. And, and then as you infuse it, then you can deliver the solution that you're intending to be injected on that, on that area. Of course, in this case, uh, I did not include in, in the list of solution the hyaluronic acid, uh, which also sometimes could be mixed with PRP, uh, giving you a very good result as well. And then you can also do that for your nerves. Uh, in this case, you do a hydrodissection of your major nerve here. And uh, the key here is that you, you have to do the hydrodissection of the perineural sheath, and then you have to hydrodissect it above the nerve, okay? As you can see it here, and you can see, and you could, it should be able to form a halo around that uh, around that nerve, and then you also inject it right at the bottom of that ner nerve in order to see that it has created actually that halo uh, portion uh, on that nerve to, to enable it to really be decompressed from the area where the nerve is actually um, undergoing some kind of a compression. As, as you can uh, tell from previous lecturers that when a nerve is compressed, it usually uh, becomes swollen. And to some extent, it's, it's not only swollen, but the fascicles inside the nerve is also swollen, even if there is no actual change in the, in the structures. So the other thing is out-of-plane approach. So in the out-of-plane approach here, uh, I, I know you've seen that being talked about by Dr. Jeff early this morning. The, the, the depth of the injection really doesn't matter because when you do the injection, it only appears as that. It could be beyond the level of the probe, still a dot, or it could be at the beginning of the dot, would, it will still be a dot that would appear in the, in the ultrasound. So in other words, you have to be very careful when you use an out of plane because whether you inject the entire needle out there, you will only see a dot. So the first time you do this, make sure that you imagine that this is actually crossing a line over here. And the first time you see it, you have to uh, withdraw it and do a step down technique. So when you do a step down technique, what happened here is that for example, in this case, I have three areas, for example. So one, two, and three. So you will notice as I run this uh, image that you will see a dot initially at number one. When you see the dot here at number one, all you have to do is to withdraw the needle back and then go down to number two, which is actually uh, at the same area because your target would be at number three. And then when you see the needle at number two, 
which you can see it right now. Then you have to withdraw it again. And then as you withdraw it, you go and shift to number three so that you can actually see the, the needle going into that joint, okay? That way, you are sure that the needle doesn't go through the area of injection and, and it doesn't affect areas that may be vital and that you might hurt some very vital structures along the way. So we call that a step-down method. And, and uh, in this case, we were, we were injecting the anterior glenohumeral joint. And the other one is, uh, of course, uh, if you are dealing with the, the irregular surface, okay? So what happened is if you actually um, put the needle directly on the target site, you won't be able to see anything. So you can put the sterile um, gel here, and then you inject through the sterile gel, and you can see the needle this way. It has not yet reached the tissue, and then you can visualize and follow the needle tip until it reaches the target. Now, this is very helpful if you are using, if you are targeting an irregular surface. And it will help you also target the site because you can see everything from start to finish because of the added uh, interface made by the gel. Now, there are other things here that needs to also be reminded, but I'm, I'm sure a lot of you have already uh, known this. For example, if your image looks like letter A, in other words, it has a very high gain versus if it's too dark, that means it has a low overall gain. Now you can make use of the time gain compensation by directing this, moving this to the left, and moving this to the right in the diagonal pattern, and that you can see all the structures here at the brachial plexus, including the muscle, the anterior and the middle scalene, for example. And so that way you can visualize the structures from top to bottom. But maybe for some of you, you may be using a matrix type of probe where you can just minimally adjust it because it actually gives you a better picture even if you don't make so much adjustment. But for those of you who are using the more conventional type of probe, then you need to make use of the time gain compensation to adjust the gain in order to see all the structures together. Otherwise, you might not see it. So here, this is an example of a bone, a rib actually, Underneath the rib is the, is, the, is the lung, and you're trying to reach these structures here, okay, that made up the cord of the spinal cord of the brachial plexus, I would say. So other than adjusting the time gain compensation, you can also select the highest frequency probe to be able to see which one is more superficial than the rest. And if you're doing um, an injection in this area, never insert the needle where you cannot actually see the region below that. For example, this is a, this is a bone. So you, you don't basically see the structures below it because it gives you an enhancement or sometimes um, an artifact over here with the shadow, the acoustic shadow, and that you might not be able to figure out the lung itself. So if you puncture this area, then of course you will not know whether you are there already. So avoid trying to puncture the area which you cannot see. And then of course, if you're using an out of plane approach, for instance, the, the shadow created by the needle approaching would create an acoustic shadow here. And you can actually use the shadow to distinguish between two nerves, for instance, in this case. And that will guide you as to your approach, whether you're injecting the, the nerve on the left or the nerve on the right. And 
this will help you approach the area where you are injecting. And then make sure that when you are using a, a needle, remove any excess air because it can also create an acoustic shadow during the injection. So just, just uh, trying to make sure that uh, you are really injecting the solution without the presence of the air here. Then of course, the use of reverberation artifact, okay? So as you can see, if the probe is parallel, if the needle is parallel to the probe, you can see the entire needle with the tip and the shaft. But then you would like to see also, how do you approach the nerve? So in order to enhance the tip imaging, you might want to adjust the bevel so that it would face towards the probe and that you can see the entire uh, tip of your needle. Of course, if you are very skillful in doing this, you don't need to change anything there because actually what the bevel will do is it also will affect the direction of your injection. If, if the bevel is going facing up, the direction the needle is going down. If the bevel is facing down, the direction the needle is going up. So, but if your concern is to see the entire shaft to the tip of the needle, then it might help you adjust a little bit about your uh, direction of the bevel. And then sometimes also, as in the case in the, here in figure C, there is an image where it seems that there is a bent needle at the distal part of the needle. So what actually produces this imagery here is because of the difference in the velocity of the tissue. So this, this one is muscle, this one is fat. So that difference in the interface between these two tissues will actually create an abnormal image of the needle as if there is a bent needle here. So if you see that, uh, don't be surprised that your needle is bent because it's not bent, it's because of the interface between the muscle and the adipose tissue, which is above it. So when injecting, you can also in, uh, incorporate your Doppler to be able to rule out the presence of blood vessels in that area. You can either use a collar Doppler or a power Doppler, depending on the purpose of your injection. And then of course, we mentioned already the bevel orientation. It should be facing toward the nerve so that the needle will pass the nerve rather than puncture it. So for instance, uh, this is the nerve here. So you can actually inject it in such a way that you don't puncture the nerve here. And then of course, if you are navigating between two nerves, the bevel should be facing toward the closer nerve that you are going to inject. If that is your target, then that is where the bevel should be facing. And as I've said, if you are really skillful, it really doesn't matter because you will be able to eventually target the tissues where you would like to inject it. So here we are trying to hydrosect this uh, major nerve at the level of the forearm. And so you can see here the nerve being hydrodissected. Okay. Then of course, uh, how do you know that there is a successful injection? So as you can see from the previous slide, the full border of the nerve is visible after the injection. So you can see a, a halo. And then of course, if you're using a long axis view, it, it should track along the nerve in the longitudinal view. And then of course, there are other structures that are close to the nerves. And then you should use a Doppler that should separate this nerve from the, from the arteries, just to avoid puncturing those arteries. And after the injection, it becomes more echogenic as you try to approach that area and completely hydrodissect the nerve. So for smaller nerves, it's, it's kind of uh, challenging sometimes, but you have to make sure you target the nerve and separate it from the rest of the other structures until you can fully say that it is fully hydrosected and it's separated from the rest of the other structures that is close to it. So with this, I would like to thank you 
for your attention and your time. And uh, these are just simple uh, pearls and uh, some pitfalls that uh, you might want to consider when you do your injection. So thank you very much. And uh, in behalf of uh, the Philippines, thank you and welcome to the Philippines. We can visit this place. If you come here, we'll bring you there and uh, we can have a good time together. Thank you so much.